Welcome everybody in soccer down here pregame show ahead of Orlando City and Atlanta United US Open Cup semifinal. We are not in Orlando. No, we are not. We are in little five points in Atlanta GA getting you ready at the Brew House Cafe. Huge, huge game. The uh, news got a little weird last night and this morning with Joseph Martinez injured, but we have an Atlanta United starting lineup to give you right now. All right. Well, do you want to go with those who are not in the starting lineup or go with the starting lineup and build up to it? We're going with the starting lineup. We're not teasing anybody here. (laughs) Brad Gazan starting in goal. Back line left to right on the graphic. Franco Escobar, Leandro Gonzalez, Perez, Miles Robinson, Julian Gressel. Three central midfielders, Eric Remetti, Emerson, Heinemann, Darlington, Nagby. On the left wing, Ezekiel Barco. On the right wing, Pitti Martinez. And up top, Justin, one million percent, Merrim. One million percent. You start a man who says he will celebrate one million percent if he scores. You start him up top when you're missing Joseph Martinez. Substitutes the rest of the bench. Michael Parkers, Flo Pogba, Jeff Lorenowitz, Mo Adams, Tito Vialba, Andrew Carlton, Alec Can. Okay, let me see that one more time. So the graphic is in a 4-3-3 format. Honestly, I think it's going to play like a 4-3-3. Okay. Because Barco's not really a left wing back. You have your three central midfielders. I think it's going to play like the graphic says. I think it's four in the back. It's Franco Escobar at left back. Julian Gressel at right back. Julian Gressel's only other start as a true right back in a line of four was in Orlando last year, and it was a win. He had some challenges, but in this one, when you look at it, and we've talked about Orlando City, the challenges that they present are going to be on the right side. Juan getting forward as a right back. That's where they're going to have their greatest joys going forward. Gressel's going to be able to push forward a little bit and put some pressure on Joao Moutinho. And that was what you had brought up this morning, was wondering what it was going to be like on the left-hand side. And I still can't get over the fact that it's 1 million percent up top. I love every single inch of that, but it's the fact that it's 1 million percent. Justin Miram, ready to be the other JM tonight. There's, there's not a ton of easy options without Joseph Martinez. Look, teams don't have depth to replace a Joseph Martinez. It just doesn't happen. I think Brandon Vasquez would have been an option here. He's not available. I think Tito Vialba would have been an option. Not available and not in the 18 either. Your other option is Justin Merrim, who started according to transfer marked, which isn't 100% correct. It's, you know, you're, you're trying to get a good estima- estimation of where players play. According to transfer marked, Justin Merrim has played up top starting 11 times in his career. He's got three goals from that position. That's not including times where lineup shifted around and formation changed or he came on as a substitute. So Justin Merrim, a little bit of experience up top. I think he's the one who can replicate Joseph Martinez's movement the best. And in looking at the rest of that lineup in the – my hip pocket, I had thought that it might be the Remedi Heinemann Nagby triumvirate in the middle. I thought so too to start. It's the safest route. And we have other folks who are friends of the show and of the network who are sitting there and going in. You say it looks like a 4 3 3. Chris Furmeister from Pro Soccer USA says it's probably a 3 5 2 with Miram at left wing back and Barco and PT up top. That's also possible. That's the thing. Is That's the, the wild card here. So if you're, you're James O'Connor and you look at this, hmm, what is it? We haven't seen that much subterfuge in a graphic before. We, we've seen it tilt side to side, yes. but we haven't seen a, a forward end up playing left wing back. That would be a, a bold move from the graphics department at Atlanta United. And, and considering that uh, I've also noticed that it's apparently someone's birthday today, the ultimate birthday present would be to give Darren Eels the win in the semifinal. Yeah, he would love that. He might, uh, he might end up buying another billboard. In a, or yes, I'd probably buy several on uh, the Florida Turnpike and that I-4 stretch, wouldn't you? Um, yeah, I'm down with that. That can work. And we'll see. We're, we're having folks putting predictions out, so if you're listening to us live, go ahead and give us your predictions. If you're here at Brew House, be sure to shout them out before, before kick. No cheating. We have 1-0 in the back. That's good. But That's where I'm at. I'm, I'm at 1-0 on this. 
I think it's going to be a tight one. I think we might be here a little while. Yeah. It's going to be a challenge. I mean, Orlando City, this is the biggest game in their club's history. They're going to be up for this, and it's a much better Orlando City team than I think Atlanta United's ever seen. You have to go back to 2015 Orlando City, which was their best season ever, by the way. They've gotten worse every season until this one. You'd have to go back to that to find an Orlando City squad that's comparable, I think, to what you have now. It's a a good, balanced team. It's not outstanding, but it's a good team, and they have presented their lineup for tonight. Orlando City's lineup is out. It is, on the picture, a 4-3-3. That would sound about right. Left to, oh, let's see, in net, Grinweiss in net to start tonight. Yeah, he started every cup game. They're going to keep rolling with him. So he is taking the, uh, the role of uh, Petr Cech in, uh, in this particular run. Yeah, I mean, it's common. You, you give a, a backup goalkeeper some time, you have to get some games in case things happen. And, and when, when he gets you through in the penalty shootout like last time, you, you have to give him this game. The four at the back, left to right, Moutinho... Jansen, Sané, Juan. Yeah, no surprises there. That's their standard back four. Middle three. Screaming Will Johnson, Sasha Kleshton, and Mendez. So no Osquez. No. Okay. And it looks like Osquez was the uh, international that was left out in its entirety. Your top is Nani, Dwyer, and Antesho. Wow. So Osquez not in the 18. Your subs, Dijon, Benji Michelle, Chris Mueller, O'Neill, Powers, Yuri Rossell and Brian Rowe. I'll tell you that I feel a lot better facing a midfield of Will Johnson and Mendez than Mendez and Osquez. That's an it's an interesting decision. I mean, Orlando City they had I think they had eight internationals, so you were going to have to drop three. Um, I don't remember the names right off the top of my head, but there were two that were kind of obvious. There were six that are regulars, right. and you had to leave one out of the eighteen entirely. It's Osquez. That's, that's a surprise to me. Trying to gauge what uh, the, the fans of the purple team think about that particular 11. We'll get into that as we go. Once again, let us know what you're thinking. Whether you're listening to us online, whether you're live, yell at us while we're here at the brew house because it is pre and post here at the brew house tonight. And uh, thanks to our hosts for letting us hang out here. This yeah, time. we might even hop on at halftime. I don't know what kind of halftime show uh, ESPN Plus is going to have for us, but we might take over locally at least. There you go. At least here at the brew house if you're coming down. And, and there are still seats available. It is a chance to get down here. I know traffic is crazy. It's Atlanta. We all know this. But you've got plenty of time to head down here. Call your Lyft. Call your Uber. Get on down and uh, join us here at the brew house cafe. Let's see. We have folks. uh, Jason Wright from the Jason Wright Agency, the commissioner of the Fantasy League, says it'll be interesting to see Miriam up top. Anyone want to go over or under on the 65th minute for Tito subbing in? Well, no Tito in the 18, correct? Uh, So sorry, sorry, Kamish. Yes. That's not going to happen. I'm going to go the under on that one. All right. There you go. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Keith Filer is saying 2-1 Atlanta in extra time. Chris Kilroy listening live on the app. 2-1 to the good guys. I guess I should say 2-1 to the good guy. Okay. Quoting uh, Razor Ramon there. And let's see, what else do we have? Uh, Kefsi says that Rometty's going to be busy, but I like seeing the options going forward. Yeah, well, you've got cover for Rometty. You, you've got, instead of what we saw Saturday, where it was Barco as a number 10, you've got three central midfielders who can all defend. The, the question for me and my concern when you go back to that LAFC match is you've got the three central midfielders that are all pretty similar. There has to be some separation of duties here. There has to be some delineation as to who is sitting, who is going forward. They have to be on the same page. I felt like LAFC, in that bad stretch of 12 minutes, it got too flat too often, and there was too much hesitation of who to step, who's covering, who's got my back, who's the balance. With Jeff Lorenowitz in there, it's obvious. You know he's going to sit more. With this group, there has to be communication. And, and for me, Eric rometty has got to be the one to sit more. You want Nagby to, to find the space in between the lines. You want Emerson Hindman to push forward more. I think he's a little more comfortable in that role. Remetti has to stay home behind those two for the most part. And if he does step, they've got to they've got to cover. Now, okay, we have a correction. Yeah, Tito is in the 18. Okay, I thought you said he wasn't in the 18. <laughs> well, I thought you said that you were asking me if he was in the 18, and I said yes. Ideas, Mio. Anyway, 
Tito Vialba is in the 18, so yep. I take the over then, uh, yes. Kamish. Yeah. I, I, I changed my pick. There you go. I had faulty information. Oh, do we, have, uh, do we have an amended pick from Doug Robertson of the AJC? No, we do not. Why don't you go ahead and text Doug and see if he'll give us an amended pick. My pick this morning on the show was 1-0 Atlanta in extra time with Tito getting the goal. I thought Pereira might be in the team, but it is Pogba in the team as the other international. You had to drop one. So I, Pereira can't give you the assist and give you the uh, matching lion tattoo photo. So I will go with Emerson Hindman on the assist. All right, so I'm texting Doug right now. All right, let's see if we can get Doug. live radio him now. Yes, Doug is there in Orlando. He has arrived. He, he is safe and, and well. He has not been accosted yet by the, uh, the Country Club Ultras, as Mike Conte called them. That hasn't happened yet. All right. We're going to get into the questions out there because there's a ton, and, and everything seems to revolve around Justin Merrim. Is he up top? Is he a wing back? How's it going to work? Look, I can tell you guys from a, a little bit of behind the scenes, graphics aren't always what they're cracked up to be. There is a bit of gamesmanship. Y- you have to at this point. And this is the prime example because this could play like a 4-3-3 exactly as the graphic is identified. And I think that would be probably the most obvious play. It could also be a 3-5-2 as Chris Furmeister from Pro Soccer USA said with Merrim as a left wing back. You could have that happen. Also, you could have one happen and then change to the other. That's where it gets really tricky. If you've been able to work on these things and you want to throw a curveball, happens in the cup all the time, that would be the way to play it. You know, Jordan, you could have just yelled out the pick. <laughs> I like it. It's all good. It's live. It's, that's what it's about. It's about distraction. <laughs> so Jordan, who is sitting, what, about eight feet away from us? Yeah, about eight feet. So he says 3-2 uh, Atlanta United extra time. Ooh. Ooh, that's a lot of goals. That is. I don't think it's going to be that many. Ooh, I don't know. Dan, I'm, I'm not sure. Dan Murphy has 2-1 Atlanta United extra time. Lion Tamer went the dagger in minute 117. A lot of questions about Tito, and, and people thought that he would go straight into the lineup. I, this is a guy who hasn't played in almost two months and hasn't trained really except for the last month. And I'm not sure if he's trained every day in the last month. That's a big ask. And, and in this type of game, you have to think about 120 minutes. You have to be worried about guys who can't finish. Tito would not be able to play 120. I don't know if Tito could play 90. Okay, so Doug, Doug Robertson is sticking with his 2-1 Atlanta pick. Yep. That is official. Yeah, that is official. I have it on my phone. All right, so for the Bailey Daily poll... I had a 1-0 extra time. Doug has a 2-1. You had a 2-1 because you always have 2-1. Correct. Because that's just what you do. I got me trophies. Yeah, anyway. I think it's actually going to be a 1-0. Uh, Alex was... Alex at Cuppers okay. has the OSG Nelson special. Yeah, yeah. It's becoming a thing. That scares me. <laughs> All right. There was some other news around the league today. DC I've heard... United has been active trading everything that they own and acquiring more GAM and TAM and players. And Let me see if I can reset here. They've added Felipe from Vancouver. They've added Emmanuel Boateng from L.A. They added $212,500 in TAM or in GAM? Efforting. I think it's TAM because I think they traded GAM and an international slot. That's a very MLS trade. They're losing Wayne Rooney next year. I don't think they're necessarily done either. Um, it's chaos. And L.A. Is, is in chaos mode, too, because they're trying to get, according to Kevin Baxter of the L.A. Times, L.A. is trying to get enough TAM to sign Christian Pavone, get under the cap, and I think clear an international slot? Yeah, they have to. So an international slot, money... And to allocation money and, and getting him under the right salary and the right loan amount. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So they get Felipe from Vancouver. Vancouver gets a 2020 international roster slot instead of a 2019 international roster slot. Yeah, because Vancouver is not going to be able to use it this year. So that's, that's smart business on the Whitecaps. So, yeah, it was 212.5 in TAM from the Portland Timbers. That's very exact. That sounds like there is something lined yeah, up for that yeah, 212.5. Yeah, 
and it was 50000 in GAM from Minnesota United. Okay, and they are linked to an Argentine winger uh, who is playing in Spain. They have also reportedly had conversations with Yamil Assad. They have had Jose Francisco Torres in camp, trialing, who is a free. Um, I think there's another player. Oh, Danny Williams, who was formerly of Reading, and I believe might still be of Reading. uh, DC... There's a quiz later on. Yeah, seriously. But DC, the thing is, they could win the East. Yeah. Like, it's not crazy to think that DC could win the East. You've got the, uh, the let's send Wayne Rooney back to England with a trophy tour going on. DC's very good. I don't know if they're going to have a hashtag for that. It's a lot of words. But hashtag DCU. DC is very good. No, no, the, the, the trophy tour. Um, it, it's going to be interesting in the East because I think you're going to have other moves pop up in response. You, you're going to have to. And one question is here in Atlanta. George Bellow, we saw him firsthand with Atlanta United 2. 45 minutes and he looked good. Yep. No setbacks that we've heard about. He nope. trained with the first team on Monday. Check. You'd think he's getting pretty close. You still have no cover beyond him on the left side Correct. with Mikey Ambrose still out. And you don't really have true cover on the right side for Franco Escobar in a four-man back line. You can play Julian Gressel there, and we might see it tonight if they play a 4-3-3. But that's riskier, and it's something that Frank DeBoer did not want to do earlier this season. Chris Kilroy with a question. Okay. If we have time for transfer talk, don't we have one slot open on the roster still, or did Mo Adams take that? Any chance we can get a little fullback depth by tomorrow? There are roster possibilities, and we're going to pull those up right now because MLS likes to make things complicated. It's not super simple, and I want to give you guys the correct information. There's definitely spots when you're talking about minimum salary, homegrown, that type of situation. But to get what I think Chris Kilroy's talking about, you're looking for a veteran because you need somebody who can jump in and play if needed. There's possibilities out there. We saw Eric Miller move, for example. Eric Miller was traded from Minnesota here recently. So you're seeing possibilities. He ended up in New York City. That would be the type of player you would want, a player who can play on either side in the back, a player who can step in and and jump right into action if there's an injury or whatever. I don't think you can rely on a minimum salary player or a homegrown for that situation. According to the MLS website, which is not always correct, by the way, you have a senior roster spot available. You have a reserve roster spot available. The reserve roster would be a homegrown. That's really the only way you could do it, or a very young minimum salary signing, which is not what you need. You do have a senior roster spot open, and you do have an international slot open. So you have some flexibility if you need to get busy in the market tomorrow. Neil Blackman adding his two cents in on the matchup tonight. He says, based solely on lineups, it seems like Orlando City will sit deeper and defend similar to the NYCFC strategy, was enough to get to penalties in the quarterfinals. Will it be tonight versus Atlanta with the big home crowd behind them? Question mark. Hashtag USOC 2019. Well, then he he continued, or or our friend Jarrett continued, if that's the case, I get it, but I I can't imagine the fans being cool with sitting deep so much. Honestly, for Orlando fans, I don't think they care. I think it's just about winning something, anything beating Atlanta for the first time ever. I don't think they care how they do it. No, until further notice, until I see what the crowd looks like. For me, it's just Orlando fan and not Orlando fan. They'll they'll have a good crowd. I mean, it's not going to be full, I don't think, but they'll have a good crowd. Do you see who's uh, joined us here? I did see who's joined us. Taking pictures surreptitiously (laughs) and putting them on social media. Ah, well, you know, it happens. It's all good. We might get you up on a mic here in a minute, Kelly. That was a big thumbs up from Kelly. All right. So... You've seen the lineup. Yes. We've had the talk about yeah. what it could look like. Yes. What do you think it plays like? Mm. I honestly like the 4-3-3 three, three with Miram as the absolute point of the spear mm-hmm. and having Marco and PT working their way in behind. That's how I'm viewing things. But I also, for me, when I saw the, the midfield triumvirate that we were discussing with Heinemann, Rometty, Nagby, I like that combination from what we saw up at fifth third last time out. So for me, if it ain't broke in the competition, go for it, and that's what you got. 
I, I think either way you spin it, there's risk involved. If, if Merrim is the forward, it's not a position he's you know, played a ton, but he, he's played. He's played more as a forward than he has as a left wing back. Let, let's make that clear. His only left wing back experience or left back experience, any kind of defending experience, has been over the last couple of matches here in Atlanta. So Merrim as a forward is not craziness. Barco and Pitti as essentially dual false nines, that's pretty creative. Mm-hmm. That, but, that is some abstract painting at its best from Frank DeBoer, if that's the case. But when you have what Felipe Cardenas of the Athletic refers to as a diferente, and you have that kind of a talented artist mm-hmm. to begin with, I don't mind painting outside the lines with individuals like Barco and Pitti who can be in and around Justin Miram, who's working his way up top. Well, no, them playing with Miram up top is fine. I'm saying if it is a 3-5-2 and if Miram is a left wing back, mm. if, if the, the graphic is trying to throw off James O'Connor, okay. which it could be, yes. having Barco and Pitti up top together, yeah. to me, that feels not like painting outside the lines. That's like painting, instead of painting on the canvas in front of you, that's painting on the ground behind you. <laughs> it would be really different. Doesn't mean it can't work. No. But false nine, I think a lot of people have the opinion that anybody can just jump into a false nine role and it's fine and it's it's easy. It's not something that is simple to do and it's hard to get out of balance when you do it. It's something that usually takes a little bit of time. That would be a very a very wild move to make on the fly because this injury happened. You know, late in training. Yeah. Nobody said anything about him ending training early or anything like that. You didn't train on it unless there's a lot of fakes on it. There's a lot of faking could be going on, but I don't think that's the case. I think it's a legitimate injury. I think Joseph Martinez is unavailable, and you're having to figure it out winging it. Because you've got more fish in the barrel than just tonight. You've got NYCFC coming up. You don't know... You want to err on the side of caution when it comes to Joseph. You don't want to trot him out tonight, have it get worse, not have him for NYC, right. and then ha- not have him for more than just not at NYCFC. You're, you're right. talking multiple competitions, multiple ideas in trying to make sure that your talisman is healthy for the stretch run because, yes, you're chasing an Open Cup, but that's why you built this roster the way that you did in the first place so you can have the – the roster flexibility to come at opponents from a bunch of different ways and still chase after MLS Cup. Saw takes straight away with the Martinez talk this morning that Atlanta's not taking this competition seriously. Uh, <laughs> that lineup should tell you otherwise. It is as first choice as you can be right now. I believe that would be a Dikembe Matumbo finger wag worth of uh, putting that to bed immediately. That sounds about right. And it, it, I believe the direct quote would be something along the lines of, no, 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 no. Something like that. That was your Dikembe Mutombo? On short notice, yes. Okay. All right. That's, that's, uh, that's something. <laughs> I don't really have anything else for you. That's something. <laughs> I'm working on it, Kelly. Give me time. So a couple things about the transfer window. Let's jump back to that real quick before we, we finish with a lot of Atlanta Orlando talk. It closes tomorrow at 1 a.m. our time. It closes at midnight central time because the U.S. Soccer Federation is based in Chicago in the central time zone. Complete with GoBots and everything else. They might be the ones that are waiting by the fax machine to see what comes in. On CompuServe? Um, I, hope, I hope they've moved up to Prodigy at least, but we'll see. It's, things could go down to the wire. I mean, this feels like the kind of year that you could see some wild moves late in the window because you've got the LA Galaxy that, according to their beat writer, are not able to sign Christian Pavone right now. They don't have the spots. They don't have the money to do it. They're going to try to make that happen. DC is still trying to upgrade. They're trying to figure out what they're going to be. I think there's other teams that are going to be active as well. I haven't seen any other rumors as of late, but... I really think you're going to see some moves tomorrow night. Things are going to get weird, and this could be the first MLS window that has that, that feel to it. It's not like England where you could have people literally like driving across the country to get there in time for the medical, and you got reporters like tailing them down what the M5. 
I don't think we're going to have that. We're not going to have people hop in planes. Microphones and car windows and things yeah. like that asking questions. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to have that, but I think this window could get really interesting. Do we have anything new out of the L.A. Times? Kevin Baxter says, Yet all remains officially quiet regarding the Galaxy's acquisition of Argentine winger Christian Pavone. Same with LAFC's attempt to sign Uruguayan winger Brian Rodriguez. Directly quoting Baxter, I say officially quiet because as of early Tuesday morning, reasonably both deals are done, at least agreed upon. Ink may not be dry on all the paperwork, but I don't see any major obstacles left that would block either transfer. Some other things that are out there. Gaston Sauro, center back for Columbus, uh, is leaving the club, headed to Toluca in Mexico. Sam Stejkal is reporting uh, from Pablo Maurer that it was 250000 in TAM for Emmanuel Boateng. That is a huge price tag for a player that has been a bench player for the Galaxy. Funding the acquisition of Pavone, according to Baxter, a couple of hours ago. Initially, the thought was that a, the Galaxy would be dealing another veteran player this afternoon, but it is now apparently going to be cash for cash, and a corner of the Galaxy is saying that it's going to be cash for cash with Orlando City. More a GAM TAM deal? One of the GAM, GAM TAM deals, and we don't know which AM is heading in which direction. The TAM's got to be headed to L.A. because that's what they've been stocking, so... You're going to have to use TAM to get Pavone. You're not going to be able to use GAM there, I don't think. There's another one out of Montreal. Remember last week we talked about Bojan Kerkic, the former Barcelona player, currently at Stoke City, or is he out of contract at Stoke City? Montreal was in after him. Well, now the LA Galaxy are in on that one too. According to reports out of Montreal, in French, Bojan Kerkic could be headed to the Galaxy. How are they going to fit everybody? What are oh, they doing? Well, uh, you know, remember the conversation that we had offline about uh, Rooney and FFP and getting around that as a player coach, Coach Pavone. And that's not happening. <laughs> MLS is not going to have that. They've got all kinds of crazy rules to prevent these sorts of things. And don't think that all the front offices aren't looking at certain front offices and seeing how they go around and create space and rules and using AM and... All of that stuff. The other one that was out there earlier, and it, it doesn't appear to be uh, too accurate at this stage, is Chris Pontius, former D.C. United winger slash forward. Uh, Chris Pontius could be headed back to D.C., hmm. but that might not happen now. And 20 minutes ago, uh, Arcadio Marcuzzi, who covers the Montreal Impact in French for their broadcast, says that Kirkich will arrive in Montreal tonight and could be presented tomorrow at their Canadian Championship match. So maybe the Galaxy are going to have to intercept that plane. Um, talking about Atlanta and depth, there is a player out there right now that Atlanta could sign that would solve all those problems. Who? And he's a local guy, and he was just waived by the Houston Dynamo, Chris Duvall. Okay. Chris Duvall was waived by the Dynamo today. He hasn't played for Houston, really. Um, played around in the league. He's played with New York, played with Montreal. Yep. Duvall is a player who played at Wake Forest, um, played for the Atlanta Silverbacks Reserves. We had him when I was with the Reserves uh, when he was 18 playing with that team and went on to have a great career at Wake Forest, great career with the Red Bulls, and he's moved around the league a little bit. Mostly a right-sided player, but he could fill in on the left. And Chris Duvall could be a guy that Atlanta United could add to the roster. And if he's available on waivers, there you go. So keep an eye on that one. I have officially done that on the Twitters, by the way. Okay. At Chris Duvall 9 1 on I, the Twitters. I like that idea. I think that's a great fit. You want me to ask him if he wants to come back home and play on Twitter? No, no, let's not start anything. We don't need to start transfer rumors. Let's not do that. All right. Line up. Let's go through it one more time. All right, effort. You're looking on the graphic for Atlanta United tonight, the back line of Franco Escobar, Leandro Gonzalez Perez, Miles Robinson, Julian Gressel. Three central midfielders, Eric Rometty, Emerson Heinemann, Darlington Nagby. Front three, Barco on the left, Pitti on the right, and Merrim up top. There is the possibility that Justin Merrim plays as a left wing back. Everything slides over, and Barco and Pitti play as dual false nines, essentially. Could happen. I think it's more likely it plays like a 4-3-3. I really do. The substitutes, Parkhurst, Pogba, Lorenowitz, 
Mo Adams, Tita Vialba, Andrew Carlton, who came up in discussions this morning, and Alec Can. All right. Interesting. Okay. And we'll go over the Orlando lineup when I can uh, drag it back up. The Orlando lineup is about as first choice as they can get. Um, the only surprise for me was Carlos Asquez, the Peruvian, being left out because they have more internationals than they can field in an Open Cup game. You're limited to five. They have six that play regularly. I thought Asquez should have been in there. I think he's one of their most important players. He was left out. Grenwis and Nett. Moutinho, Jansen, Sané, Juan, Johnson, Question, Mendez in the middle three, Nani, Dwyer, Tesho up top. Your subs, Dijon, Benji, Michelle, Chris Mueller, O'Neill, Powers, Yuri Rossell, and Brian Rowe. Last round, Orlando got through NYC on penalties. Orlando sat back and defended a lot. Last time Atlanta saw Orlando, they came in and played a 3-5-2 that played a lot like a 5-3-2, with the exception of Juan pushing forward from the right side. They're not in that 3-5-2, 5-3-2 tonight, but that does feel somewhat like a lineup that could sit. The exception is that they didn't play three central midfielders that are all comfortable sitting. You've got Sasha Kleschen in there as a playmaker. And it's a big opportunity for Kleschen because Orlando just went out into the market, added a designated player as a number 10. Kleschen, if he wants to keep getting time, Mm -hmm. he's got to come up with a big performance tonight. Yeah, and I I was going to say, how did you see Kleschen if it was going to drift into a 3-5-2? Does he pull back or is he part of the push forward? I don't – there's not another – without a squeeze, there's not another center back. So it's going to be a 4-3-3 for them, but it could play much more like a 4-5-1 and sit more. Or even a 4-4-2 because Dwyer and Akindeli can both play as forwards. When you look at Orlando, my question's looking at this. Does it end up playing a lot like a 4-4-2, but it's a box midfield? with Johnson and Mendez sitting behind Kleschen and Nani tucking in and Dwyer and Akindeli up top functioning as forwards. When you look at it from an Atlanta perspective, Orlando's going to want to go forward a lot from their right side. Moutinho on the left is going to sit more. Juan is going to push forward more. Franco Escobar on the left, if Atlanta plays the 4-3-3, is going to be very important in this dealing with Huan and dealing with Akindeli at times, too. You're going to have to get some support from Barco if he is your left winger. He's going to have to drop and help, especially when Huan pushes forward. That's a side for Atlanta that could be an issue. The other side of the field, Nani's not going to give you much defensively for Orlando. Moutinho, in my opinion, is honestly more of a number eight, more of a technical central midfielder than a left back. He's not that fast. You're going to be able to take advantage of him. And if you think back to last year, Moutinho was with LAFC, and Atlanta took advantage of him a lot. Pitti Martinez has to be licking his chops at running at Joao Moutinho. And for those that remember the name Tesho, the comeback in Dallas last year, that's where a lot of folks remember Tesho Akindeli. Akindeli's had success against Atlanta, and that Dallas game will give him a lot of confidence, but... It's a different role for him in Orlando. He has to give you something as a winger. He's going to have to drop back some and cover. But with Huan pushing forward so much, Akindeli's not comfortable dropping all the way back. That means you're going to have to get Mendez or Johnson sliding over. And Johnson's played some right back. That's possible. But then everything gets pulled out of shape. Atlanta centrally, it feels like to me the Remetti, Nagby, Heinemann trio is better than the Mendez, Johnson, Kleschen trio. And that's where Atlanta should be able to make a lot of hay tonight. Chris Ashley at Youth Guy Cash, one of our perpetual guests on the Greenville Triumph Weekly Show on the network, says, Give me 2 nothing Atlanta. Miriam, a first half goal, Tito, stoppage time goal to kill the spirits of Orlando. Spirit, emotion, uh, there's going to be a lot of that in this game tonight because it's a cup game. It is a rivalry. 
you've got to manage it. Justin Merrim is going to have to manage the emotions going back to Orlando, and you know he wants to score 27 goals tonight. Yes. He's not going to do that. You know he wants to. He's got to manage that. He can't get himself into trouble. He can't burn himself out too early. Pitti Martinez, Ezekiel Barco, two guys who you're going to be looking to to pick up the slack for Joseph Martinez. They've got to pace themselves a bit because Pitti played 90 on the weekend. He hasn't played 90 a ton. Ezekiel Barco got into the 60-minute mark. Can he give you 90? I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. Tito Vialba, we don't know how many minutes he has. Frank DeBoer felt like he had some to give tonight. He mentioned that on Saturday. But how much can he give you off the bench as a spark plug? You don't know. You're going to need Merrim for 90, maybe 120. You're going to need Pitti, 90, maybe 120. Barco, I just don't see him getting 120 if it goes there. I don't know if he gets 90. Your central midfield trio, you need all of them potentially to give you 120. Your back line should be able to give you 120, but Escobar and Gressel are going to have to pace themselves as well. That's the challenge of an open cup match. That's the challenge of a knockout match. And we're going to see this in the playoffs. Everything's one game. When you get into this, things get weird, and you have to think differently with your substitutions. Remember, you get the fourth substitution when you get into the added 30. Shiva really wanted to see Parkey or Jeff in the starting lineup. I thought we might see Michael Parkhurst because of his veteran leadership. I didn't expect to see Lorenowitz. I don't know if Jeff has got 90 minutes in him on short rest. That's, that's the type of concern at, for both of those guys at this point. I thought we might see Parkhurst here. I thought if we, if we see a 3-5-2 or 5-3-2, you could see Escobar as a left wing back and Parkhurst as one of the center backs. If things have to get changed, wouldn't surprise me if that's one of the moves you make. Will Palmer on Twitter. He's thinking 2-1 Atlanta, Tito Vialba getting the second extra time. He's a little disappointed not seeing Brad Gazan in the nine spot. <laughs> I, I, I hope it doesn't come down to that. I hope we don't have to see Brad Gazan as a forward. I don't know if there is a, fee, a uh, regular jersey made up for Brad tonight. I'm going to go with no. <laughs> I don't think there is a number one in Peach for Brad Gazan ready to go. It's got to. I mean, that'd be great, though, wouldn't it? Just to, just for the kit, not to use him as a nine. I'm just saying to have a Peach kit with a Gazan and a one. Oh boy. See, I keep, I keep staring at Kelly, waiting for her to finish her salad. <laughs> she, All right, come she, on. Come on. Kelly Francis. <laughs> if we get, if we get fake Brad Gazan with his FIFA stats, then yes, he can have the peach kit and have the number one for sure. There you go. All right, I'm going to swap out. Kelly's going to come in and kind of hang out. All right, cool. Noted Atlanta soccer talker Kelly Francis joins us right now. Soccer talker. Soccer talker. Soccer talker. <laughs> Does that work for you? That works for me, absolutely. All right. Um, so it's, I've, I've run across a lot of um, statements recently that I felt like being tattooed on my body. That's one of them. I'll soccer just figure talker. out where soccer talker fits somewhere on okay. my persons. Hey, there you go. You've yeah. seen the lineup. What do you think it's going to do? <laughs> that's, that's the funny thing. I, I, I know Atlanta United media team does the lineup specifically like this, so it confuses everybody. Sometimes. Um, and sometimes we actually end up coming out pretty much like the lineup is. And also I know that true. this sort of started happening uh, last year with Tata. I, for the most part, I felt like the first year we were very accurate on what we were actually going to do in the lineup. And then It, it was about I, midway through last year where there were directives given. Yes. Right, and Tata was like, oh, we don't have to do that anymore. We can just basically put them wherever <laughs> yes. and confuse everybody. And it's right. obviously carried over. And, you know, it's, it's a good tactic to use. And any team honestly does it. But um, Miram as a striker. So I want to talk to you about this because I know that you know absolutely everything there is no, to know. It's not true. You shake your head, but it's, it's factual. You, I can ask you about some date in 1989 in the soccer game, and I feel like you could pull it up for me. But Miram as a striker, mm-hmm. he is extremely good with the ball at his feet. He has the ability to do really well 1v1 and, and, and on the dribble. Uh, how do we see him slotting into this system with Frank DeBoer as a Joseph Martinez type striker? What's What's interesting about it is if it's a four three three, you're asking him to do things a little differently than what we've seen before. 
I thought in the three five two it was easy for him to slot in because movement off the ball somewhat similar. He's not going to be as strong in the air, but he's a smart, savvy player, and he can connect players. He's very good at bringing others into the game. In a four three three, it's a little different, but you've got Barco and Pitti flanking you. You know they're interchangeable, and that's where it gets really interesting. Something that we haven't seen from Joseph. You don't see Joseph really truly becoming a winger when he drifts out. With Merrim, you can. And that means Barco or Pitti can slide inside. I think the 4-3-3, I think it's what this team's going to play more going forward. Mm -hmm. And it's something, everybody's talked 3-5-2 and where we saw against Houston, for example. I think this team is going to be best in a 4-3-3. And I think we could see that tonight. And Merrim, look, without Vasquez, without a healthy Tito Vialba, you're kind of taking a chance no matter who you put there. He's probably your most experienced option. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see the way that he slots in with that. I know that with the 4-3-3 formation in particular, we tried it a little bit in the beginning of the season. um, But I know that we really took hold of it, honestly, which is a funny coincidence when Heinemann yeah. came on board, and we saw with the Open Cup play that we had against uh, Columbus. Yep. Was it Columbus? Uh, St. Louis. St. Louis, was sorry. The where Heinemann came in, yeah. Uh, and Pitty had a great match. He did, and the, the thing with Heinemann that I've, that I've found whenever I've watched with him is that he is able to possess space that not a lot of our players seem to drop into, and so he creates these... Um, these simple passes, right? These, this combination play where it's, it's quick movement of the ball. It's sort of getting the defenders out of their position and, and opening up spaces for chances. And I think that now that we've got Hyman sort of really honestly sitting there in between Pitti and Barco, this is the first game that we're going to see the combination play because Barco is great with combination play. Right. Same, same with Pitti Martinez. And we didn't get to see that last game because Hyman came on as a sub. Yeah. So this is going to be the first game that we really get to see what the combination play is like between those three players, and I think that's just going to be a lot for that back line to handle. I don't know if Orlando's going to be able to contain that combination play. So Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Heinemann gives you the ability to, to play Pitti out wide, to play Barco out wide, but they're in free rolls out wide. Like They're not going to be hugging the touchline, I don't think. Yeah. I think they're going to be free to cut inside. They're going to be free to interchange with Merrim. Heinemann, in my mind, makes it easier for Pitti because Pitti, without Heinemann, without Barco, Pitti was being asked to pick up 90 touches, 80 touches a game, really carry the team forward. That's not his best role. His best role is is honestly about 50 touches, but good ones and impactful ones. You want Barco carrying the team. Heinemann can carry the team. The two of them can combine, and then you're picking Pitti out at the end of a play. Not at the beginning of the play, but setting him up at the end to finish it. That's what you need. Yeah, we've seen that a lot in particular with that sort of setup with, with Nagby taking on that role. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nagby can do that as well. Yeah, uh, You know, obviously getting the ball from the midfield and, and carrying it forward into the final third. So do you see, who in this lineup do you see having the most important role on the pitch? I think if, if it's the 4-3-3, I think it's Franco Escobar because I expect Orlando to attack a lot through Juan on the right side, overlapping and dealing with Akindeli as well. I think Eric Rometty, responsible defending, is going to be the key for him. He can't get lost. He can't keep chasing too much. That's his nature, but he's got to sit and protect the back line. Those are the two that I look at from a defensive standpoint. And from an attacking perspective, I think it's Ezekiel Barco. I think Barco can make it easier for Justin Merrim in a different role. I think Barco can take some of that pressure off of Pitti and set him up to do what he does best. And I think Barco can also put the team on his back when you need to. Barco needs to get deep into the second half tonight. I don't know where he is fitness-wise. It might be stretching it a little bit. But without Joseph, you need a player like that that's going to draw the attention from the opposition. Here's my question, though, when we're talking about Franco Escobar. Mm -hmm. I've seen Franco Escobar in this lineup graphic on the left side yep. countless times. But from whenever I watched run of play, he always drifted right back to that right side. Yeah. So with us having Gressel on that right side as a right wing back, uh, having Escobar as a left wing back, is he going to stay on the left? Or are we going to see a, a shift of the back line? If it's a 4-3-3, Escobar's the left back, and Gressel will be the right back. If they shift into a 3-5-2... 
I think Escobar has to become a center back in that scenario, maybe the right center back, and then Merrim becomes the left wing back. If it's the 4-3-3, though, I think Escobar stays on the left. And I think the main reason you're thinking that way is because of Juan and what he brings to the table for Orlando. I don't think Dom Dwyer is their most dangerous player. I don't think Sasha Kleschen their most dangerous player. I think their right back, Juan, is their most dangerous player going forward. And he's the one you have to account for. Now, here's my question with that. Why wouldn't we put Pogba then in that spot? Not as mobile. Just not quite as mobile. Juan's got such speed. You need somebody who can run with him. And you need somebody who can put some pressure on him going forward. I think Pogba would be your center back in that scenario as a left back. And we saw Parkhurst play as a left back. He's not going to – Parkhurst isn't going to scare you going forward. Pogba's not going to scare you going forward on a regular basis. Escobar, you've got to be honest with that because we know what he can do in the final third. That can keep Juan back a little bit. But also Escobar might be your fastest player in the lineup who can run with Juan and cover that ground. Do we see him at, at playing a full game where he's just chasing after him, or do we see a lot of a lot of Juan sitting back and to to absorb the pressure of Atlanta United? That's the test, and, and that's what you want. If you're Frank DeBoer, you want your team to force him back. You don't want him to get forward. You want to attack that side and make them stay honest. And then even when he does go forward, you want to then play balls behind him. You want to make him have to turn and run and not be able to just backpedal. Those are the things to make him stay back more. If you make him, let's say Juan has 60 touches tonight. If half of those or more are in his own half, Atlanta wins the game. Like You want him to have the ball on the other half of the field in defensive positions, not getting forward creating. Okay, and so talking again about the Orlando lineup and, and looking at the players that are, are slotted to play here, mm-hmm. Obviously, I haven't watched a lot of Orlando games. It's not a particular team that I, I go out of my way to watch, but I That's do know. Understandable. Yeah, <laughs> I do know that consistently, Uri Rosell has been a solid defensive player for mm-hmm. them. Was there a reason in particular why they decided not to have him in the lineup today? Yeah, I'm a little surprised. I, I thought Roselle, if you're not going to play Asquez, because I, I think Orlando's best team is with Mendez and Asquez as your two central midfielders in front of the back four. If you're not going to play Asquez, I think Roselle's a better option than Will Johnson. Will Johnson's a veteran. Will Johnson has been in these moments before. We all know that. But Will Johnson's not what he was five years ago. And he's a player that runs hot. He's a player that can get himself in we, trouble we with Obviously, cards. we've seen where he's run hot. We've so seen like, that a little bit with the diving side. <laughs> Maybe you see that with picking up cards in other ways tonight. I think you can put pressure on him. James O'Connor... Just for me, it's a really weird manager to try to predict. I don't know, even at this stage, he's been there for just over a year now. I don't know if he's any further along from where they were before or not. I don't know if he's settled on his, his group, his guys. Frank DeBoer has been in the job a shorter period of time. I think Frank DeBoer has gotten so much more out of the hand he's been dealt. And not just because he's got more talent. I think the challenges he's had, he's had to get creative. He's had to move pieces around. James O'Connor, to leave Roselle out and leave Asquez out, I have some real questions about that. Is it a lack of understanding your players or a lack of imagination? I think it's a little bit of a lack of an identity. And, and it's just throwing guys into an 11 without... Like, when you think of Orlando, how do they play? Who is Orlando City in the way they play? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I've never seen a game where I've I've distinctly seen them playing. It's like, this is stereotypically Orlando. Yeah. Other, yeah, other than getting angry and emotional in the yes, game, which is, that something, would be it. which is something which James O'Connor should know to 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 tell have a full conversation with his players before they start on the pitch tonight because this is, if anything, going to be one of the most emotional games they play this year. Yep. I mean, I, I think back to last year in Orlando when they were coming in on a six-game winning streak and Jason Christ was still there, that was their biggest game ever at that point. I've never watched a team melt down emotionally like that one. And it happened 15 minutes in. It wasn't at the end. It happened early. This team's fragile, and they're better than they were last year. But you're still looking at guys like Dwyer, who's coming back off of a a red card suspension for a cheap elbow. You're talking about a guy like Sasha Kleschen who got into a fight with Josie Altador in the tunnel in Toronto. 
Will Johnson, enough said. (laughs) You're talking about guys who have had issues with these types of moments. This is going to be a moment like that times 10 because this is a chance for Orlando to get to their first final. Ever. Ever. Like, they're right there, and they could potentially host it if Minnesota wins or if uh, Portland wins. So I want to see how they handle the early stages of the match. That's... To me, I thought it'd be really interesting because of Joseph not being in, what the first 15 minutes look like. Looking at Orlando's lineup, I want to see how they handle the first 15 minutes emotionally. Can Atlanta play keep away and get them frustrated? Do you think that in the buildup of of the way they were preparing for this match, that Joseph coming out or not being available sort of threw a a wrench in their plan? I think it surprises them. I I think maybe they would have come in and been more defensive. They they could have went 3-5-2 or 5-3-2 and and sat more, and maybe they tried to open it up a little bit. Sasha Kleschen and Will Johnson as two of your central midfielders, over 30, at their stage in their career, against Nagby and Heinemann and Rometty, all guys who can cover a lot of ground, all guys who've got some speed on them. That feels like a mismatch. And that feels like a spot where maybe O'Connor's overthinking it. Maybe he's going for it a little more than he should from the start. You bring on Kleschen in the 75th minute, okay. Kleschen starting and Johnson with Mendez. Mendez is great. Uh, Sebastian Mendez is a really good player in this league. But he can't cover the ground for two guys. And, And I think Atlanta in the middle can dominate. I thought that against LAFC. I thought that in other games, too. And that trio has been good, not great for Atlanta. They need a big performance tonight. So as a standard Atlanta United fan tonight, there are, there are two questions I particularly want answered okay. um, for what it would mean. Uh, one geared toward Orlando and one geared towards us. So the first one geared toward Orlando. What can Atlanta United do in this match, first 15 minutes, first 30 minutes, First, first half, what can we do as a team to get underneath their skin to get them on, a, on an, an even foot to try to take advantage of this team's fragility? Fragility. Um, oh, absolutely. And, and I think that's a word. I think it is. <laughs> nobody, nobody, see, he's shaking his head, so I'm right. It is now. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, but, what, but what can Atlanta United do to get underneath their skin? Keep away. Keep the ball. If Atlanta in the first possession, which is something yeah. we've been done, we've been doing really well. It's, it fits. That's why you do it. Because if thir- the first thirty minutes, if Orlando has one chance, if Atlanta has sixty percent of the possession, that's a good setup because they're going to get frustrated. They're going to start chasing. They're going to start kicking it. At, they're taking chances. They're going to get aggressive and they're going to get caught out. I just drink his water. Nah, that's okay. To do that. Sorry, I do have cooties. <laughs> that's that's why I've been single all my life. Um, the next question I have is for Atlanta United specifically, and okay. what a win tonight would mean for our team and for the fact that the Open Cup final would be in Mercedes Benz. That's that's a huge coming off of a, a MLS Cup win mm-hmm. last year, and this obviously being a tournament that gets us back into the CCL, mm-hmm. despite how we end at the end of the season and what happens with the playoffs. Right. How important of a win is this tonight? I think it's huge. I think that's why the lineup is what it is. I think that's why Frank DeBoer is taking this tournament really seriously. You're looking at first choice lineups pretty much all the way through. You've had a couple rotations here and there, but you're not resting a bunch of guys in open cup matches like we saw in the past. It's massive because of it being a trophy. It's massive because of a cash prize attached to it. It's massive because you're back in CONCACAF no matter what. You get a home final now. I think it's even more massive because this team is the best in MLS since they came into the league at home. They have more home wins than anybody else in the league since 2017. You would like Atlanta's chances in a cup final at home. They've done it before. They've won. They haven't lost the knockout round game at home. They tied the one with Columbus. They lost on penalties. They haven't lost in regulation a knockout round game at home. To have that on the table for you now and to see either a Portland team that has come in and lost in a final in your building before or a Minnesota team that is very good, but you're better than and you should feel you're better than, it makes this game even more important. How crazy would it be for us to go into an uh, Open Cup final with Portland? 
That'd be uh, at Portland. Home again. W- Portland would be pretty pumped about it. Be a chance for revenge for them. Yeah, it would. And I think Portland's a team who could be at the end at MLS Cup. I think they're a team that could be there. But you look at the Open Cup final where it falls. Portland's got a lot of games to play, and they've got a lot of games at home. They're not going to be coming very, east very a, much. They have a more condensed schedule than we do. Coming yeah, to the because of, of that season. construction at Providence Park. So. They've got a bunch of home games. That's going to be a long trip for them. And, and it's something that Dome Tarrant talked about with NYC losing in Utah last weekend. He gave 10 minutes to the media after the game, and I think nine and a half minutes were about how hard travel is and how it's so hard to go coast to coast. And if you look at East Coast teams going to the West Coast, the record's really bad. Same the other way. West Coast teams coming East, it's really bad. You get Portland coming East – you're going to like your chances, again, like you had in the MLS Cup Final. That leads to a great question I have, because uh, out of all of the things that sort of came out with the MLS All-Stars and the media and the articles that were coming out and all of the information that was being poured out during last week, the, the CBA was one of the biggest ones. And oh, yeah. this whole discussion about chartered flights. And I think you said something that was very, very important, and I think should be done is that anytime you're going more than three hours on a yeah. flight, it should be chartered. You should have the option to. Yeah. It, it shouldn't count to a total. If, if teams want to still be cheap, hey, teams can be cheap. That's on them. Atlanta is really lucky in that it doesn't have to charter every time because you have flights going anywhere you want to go at all hours of the day. Sometimes this team... Like last year, they didn't use all their charters. I think the year before, they didn't use all their charters. They've got one left this year. They might not use it because you've got great flight schedules. Not every city has that. And you're, like Columbus, for example. Columbus going anywhere, you're going to have to connect. So you're taking what could be a four-hour flight and turning it into a seven- or eight-hour day. They should have the option to charter. If their ownership still doesn't want to do that, hey, that's on them. But anything over three hours... You can charter, no questions asked. If you want to put a number on flights below that to charter, okay, fine. Are we seeing a change in ownership this year? I feel like a lot of MLS teams have a lot of ownership groups that are now uh, really, I don't want to say taking it seriously, but but are obviously investing more in their teams. We're seeing Minnesota United go after young South American Mm -hmm. players and starting to really invest in that team. and, And that's sort of a cool thing to see because they were our partners coming into the league and we haven't really seen them advance they finally as much caught as we up. have. Yeah. Uh, same with um, the New England, yep. right? With the, yep. with the new coach and he's really taking an ownership of building out that roster. Robert Kraft is taking pictures with signings, finally. She never did. I don't think he even knew he had a soccer team until a few months ago. But he's taking pictures with Gustavo Bo. I think you, it's a new era for MLS because you have owners realizing that they can make money if they spend money. And you've got more aggressive ownership coming in. Columbus has changed that. You've got an aggressive owner there. You're going to have very aggressive owners in Miami. You're going to have Nashville try to push the envelope a little bit. Cincinnati realized, hey, we screwed up. We should probably take this seriously. Now they're doing it. You've got your standard big clubs like Seattle and Portland and the rest that are going to be big. The tides are changing, and any new team that comes in is going to have to be aggressive. So charter flights, being cheap, spending more money, all those things are changing now. It's a new era for MLS, and we're starting to see it. The Open Cup is another way we're seeing it. The Open Cup has been taken more seriously than ever before. The money has increased. The cachet of it has increased. And tonight should be an outstanding night for it with a rivalry match in it and a great crowd in Orlando that should create a great spectacle on TV, and it's about to start. It is. All right, question to you. What's your score prediction? 1-0 Atlanta, extra time, Tito Vialba in the 112th minute. You you literally stole my prediction. I was like, (laughs) it's going to be tough. It's going to be 0-0. We're going to have a lot of uh, shots on goal tonight. I feel like that's just something that, unfortunately, we've been really consistent on is just slightly missing, going at... It inching past the post or hitting the bar or hitting the crossbar and us getting so close to getting that goal. And I think it really, as silly and uh, as almost poetic as it would be, is that Tito is just going to come on as a sub late in the game. We're going to have stoppage time minutes, and he's just going to let a screamer out. I, I think I said this morning that he would score and then hike his shorts up even further, 
and show off the tattoo even more. And there you go. He'd run to a camera and show off the tattoo. How much would Orlando just melt if that happened? I'd hope he has police protection getting out of there. All right. We'll be back at halftime. We'll talk about the first half for those of you here at the brew house. We'll also have a post game show for those of you who are still here. Those of you who will be listening on the app. Thanks everybody for coming out. And it's about time to kick off in Orlando. Orlando.